Hello, everybody. Adam Parks here with Receivables Info. Today, I am here with two good friends to talk about AI and how that can be leveraged for the receivables management space. Today, I have two guests. I have Mr. Lee Brockett from Cascade 365. How are you doing today, Lee? I'm doing well. How about yourself? Oh, another day in paradise. We also have Shantanu from Prodigal, who has been working deep in the AI space for quite a few years now. How are you doing today, Shantanu? Doing well, and thanks for having us. Awesome. Yeah, looking, looking forward to this discussion, guys, because I know that we've had quite a few interesting discussions. Lee has a lot of expertise as it comes to the receivables management space in general, um, and he has applied some of the AI technology to his actual operating business. And Shantanu comes from more of that AI natural language processing um, and, and how to then apply that to businesses. And that's why I think this is going to be a really interesting discussion today. Um, before we kick it off, I, I would like to get a little bit of background information from you guys, kind of set the stage for your perspective in terms of our presentation today. Lee, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and about Cascade 365? Uh, yeah, of course. Um, I have worked in accounts receivable management and especially finance for the last 20 years. Um, most recently since 2008 with Cascade. Uh, we are both uh, acquirers and investors in AR, and we also manage it as well. Um, we've got sister companies, Cascade Capital Funding, which acquires and holds title to AR, uh, active in both the consumer finance and healthcare verticals. And then we've got uh, Cascade Receivables Management, um, which is an active collection agency and also master servicer of receivables. Awesome, so you've got both the investor, or you've got all three really, you've got the yeah. investor, you've got the debt buyer and the agency experience coming to the discussion today. That's really fantastic. Shantanu, exactly. can you tell everybody a little bit about yourself and Prodigal? Absolutely. Um, so I'm the CEO and founder of Prodigal. We are, uh, we are a machine learning based startup that focuses on turning all of your interactions across chat, voice, text, into insights very specifically focused on the lending ecosystem so like like we said uh, we work across providers of capital to debt buyers and investors providers of labor in some case which is agencies and and are building like a network of uh, insights that that can very seamlessly go between the two as well uh, so excited to be talking today Absolutely. So you guys are working with the creditors, you're working with the debt buyers, so you're working with the actual lenders, the debt buyers, the agencies, and then applying the AI technology to some of the scoring pieces, compliance and training, right, to help agents and others within an organization to be able to better communicate, which I think is a really interesting piece as I've learned more and more about your organization. Yeah. So as we kind of kick off this discussion today, I thought you know, AI is, is one of those terms or artificial intelligence is, is a term that gets thrown around a lot lately. And so, you know, maybe it would be helpful for us to try and define what artificial intelligence is, and then we can talk about more the application of it to the industry. But can you tell us a little bit, Shantanu, about like, from your perspective, what is artificial intelligence? So at, at the simplest level, artificial intelligence is is enabling machines and telling machines to do what humans do and that itself can take two forms one is either predictive which is make, making a judgment on the future which is everything around like credit assessment and deciding who do you call tomorrow so that they are very likely to pay that's that's forward looking as well as prescriptive which is looking back at what we did or looking what a task that we do in a very very repetitive manner and automating that uh, even just replicating human behaviors that are extremely deterministic is, is something machines can do extremely well and to that extent uh, constitutes AI. So artificial intelligence is essentially leveraging our memory, which is the prescriptive part, as well as leveraging our judgment or, or thinking, which is the forward looking part and building, building computer programs that help turn some of that uh, human judgment and human memory into, into action in a repeatable way. In a repeatable way, I like that, right? And so, you know, as, as we kind of talk about artificial intelligence and as I've learned more about it, you know, you hear 
artificial intelligence, you hear about machine learning and you hear, you know, kind of all these different keywords. Now the tools that you've kind of developed over at Prodigal is that, you know, can you help us understand kind of the difference yeah. between those two worlds and kind of where your organization has built your tool set, like between those two pieces? Uh, absolutely. I think machine learning is a very specific subset of artificial intelligence that relies on learning things in a very specific way. And natural language processing is another dimension to it. You can do natural language processing using machine learning to understand natural language, machines interpreting like our, our conversation between the three of us. There are obviously like non-machine learning ways to do it too, but machine learning has increasingly shown, especially in the last like seven to eight years, to be so much more powerful than any other paradigms to do it. Mm -hmm. That machine learning is increasingly the, uh, the the paradigm of choice when it comes to applying uh, applying artificial intelligence to problems like the ones that we deal with in our industry. So would it be safe to say that machine learning is basically the use of algorithms to use historical context to improve future predictions? Exactly. Meaning that that, that as you're as you're going through the process, for example, in Lee's world, as he's going yeah. through and collecting on accounts, identifying which accounts paid and didn't paid and what are the criteria and attributes of those particular accounts so that he could better predict in the future which accounts are going to pay so he could reallocate his efforts accordingly. Also capital, like you want to identify what what accounts to buy and there's a smart way of doing it. And then there is a spray and pay way of doing it. So we want to, we want everyone to actually do it uh, the smart way. And uh, yeah, and also a lot of repetitive tasks, right? You take notes, you kind of want people to document things, document accounts mm -hmm. in a certain way. It's just extremely cumbersome and you seldom hire people because of their skills of documentation, but mm -hmm. yet they spend anywhere between like 25 to 35% of their day doing things along those kinds. So we, we just want to delegate that increasingly to the machines. Completely understood. So, um, so the model is is constantly improving based on previous results, and you're finding ways to, let's say, automate um, time-consuming tasks, right? So, as you talk exactly. about the notes, the the collectors sitting there constantly taking notes, um, you know, after a call, like how much of that can actually pull from the speech itself. Now, I know, I know we didn't kind of have this question as we were preparing, but I have to ask it, right? So from an AI perspective, right? Yeah. Like you're, you're coming in with these learning models to improve results, right? But you're also having to tie that back to natural speech, right? And yeah. I know that kind of that natural speech learning is, is one of your areas of expertise personally. Can you tell us a little bit about how those two worlds come together? Right, the, the speech world and this like digital understanding of constant process improvement. Like how do those marry together at Prodigal? Uh, so great question. So uh, so natural language kind of helps understand um, what, what happened on the call, which is the human understanding part of it. Mm. And then we, we set up the product so that it actually automates and eliminates a lot of the grunt work that people spend a lot of time doing. And that is how, how the product really like ties the ribbon on the whole thing by saving agents time. So instead of taking two minutes to wrap up every single conversation, we get it done in like two seconds. And that mm -hmm. gives back a lot of time to, to agents and not just, not just time to the agents. Right. Uh, I, I would love Lee's perspective on this, but as a, as a dead buyer working with a large network of agencies, uh, you want, you, you want to encourage some kind of cross pollination. You want to encourage, uh, if, if not cross pollinate with each other, but as a, as a dead buyer, you want to absorb in a very structured and standardized way, everything that is happening across all of your portfolio that might be worked by, by like dozens of agencies. Uh, current, currently, like the way people take notes, my, my email style is very different. Similarly, my note taking style is very different from yours, I presume, which is different from Adam's, I presume, uh, as, as a result of that, it is extremely important that, uh, once you standardize it, you all, all make it all machine readable. And that unlocks a lot of further like predictive power because uh, you're able to understand how many people claim bankruptcy, but don't actually have, have not filed bankruptcy. How many mm -hmm. people, you know, just, just come out of the gate being extremely offended that you even call them. But eventually when you listen, when they listen to options, 
think that it's actually a very, very reasonable and right thing to do to close the account by paying in full. So currently, a lot of those insights kind of fall through the crack or we barely like get get like a 5% view on what happened. Our goal is to make it like comprehensive, like give them 100% understanding and we do that by doing it in a very structured uh, synthesis of, of every interaction between between someone on your team and the customer. Well, I'm, I'm curious from, from that perspective, because you bring up a good point about the differentiation between a collection agency and a debt buyer, right? Yeah. Because a collection agency has got these multiple clients, but then a debt buyer in the inverse is generally mm-hmm. going to have multiple agencies. So Lee, in terms of Cascade, like I know that you guys have an internal collection agency, but are you also leveraging an external network? Uh, yeah, uh, the vast majority of our collections uh, occur and are generated uh, through our network. Okay. Um, so the master servicing platform at Cascade Receivables Management um, very much relies upon a centralized platform uh, that works uh, hub and spoke. Um, so you know, we have a, a one to many relationship mm-hmm. um, with a good number of vendors in the, in the industry, uh, collection agencies, collection law firms. Um, so a tool like Prodigal and what uh, Shantanu has built uh, enables us to really control the compliance risk yeah. and the performance throughput um, from a centralized manner. Because uh, without tools like, like Prodigal, um, we, we, we'd be unable to really keep tabs on all of our outsource vendors in a, in a meaningful manner, um, which is obviously very important. Um, we want to make sure that uh, Cascade consumers are treated um, not only within within the meets and bounds of the law, but also um, within uh, our own personal ethical and, and moral uh, matrix of what we find yeah. acceptable. Yeah, sure. Um, so, so Prodigal de- definitely helps out with that. So from um, so from a, a connection perspective between the two organizations, you're using some of the Prodigal tool sets and, and the AI intelligence to evaluate I'm assuming more of the calls, right? It's been my experience that when I'm using an outsourced network of agencies, and let's say I've got 25, or 30 agencies that are, are doing work for me, that's a lot of outbound phone calls, right? And especially as your organization has grown over time and the volume of accounts that you're working has grown over time, you know, how do you then find balance? And so I think that the application of the AI technology has been very important in that process and in enabling all of us to actually um, listen to more of those calls. Because I remember there was a point in time, and, and this isn't a, a, a statement about Cascade specifically, just as I was working in comply arm in the compliance space, that there had to be some random selection of calls to be listened to by an individual. And so I would have two or three or four people on staff that were sitting there listening to calls all day. But based on the total volume of outbound calls, I could only listen to so many, right? And then we had manual scorecards that we were sitting there doing, but that that left a lot of reliance on these individuals that were listening to the calls to be consistent. You know, if one of those auditors, right, was having a bad day, are they then going to score things differently than if they were having a good day, right? Or, you know, are they feeling different on a Tuesday versus a Friday? And those kinds of things are, you know, are actual and real concerns when you're trying to generate consistency, right? It's a concern when you're dealing with managing collectors, but it's also a concern when you're dealing with the auditors themselves. So I'm assuming... You know, have you found more consistency in your ability to audit? Have you found your, uh, a, an ability to cover a larger volume of calls by leveraging technology? Yeah, I, I would say the, the, the biggest advantage is just the scalability of it. You know, like, hmm. like you said, uh, a handful of people uh, listening to calls all day long and, and, and completing um, uh, scorecards uh, hmm. is very hard to scale. It's, it's impossible, yeah. right? Um, so yeah, so the fact that you can you know program uh, the, the the tool uh, within Podigal, uh to you know uh, uh, to look for keywords uh, being spoken or not being spoken, the mini Miranda for example, or uh, profanity, um, et cetera, they have a really good mousetrap and, and uh, uh, the, the the sandbox that they've developed um, that we've customized for 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 Cascade. Um, it's uh, it's pretty nifty, you know, because it really catches, um, uh, we found it to be very, very complete in catching um, any issues of non-compliance, um, even, you know, small things about like uh, maybe the mini Miranda uh, wasn't, yeah. wasn't yeah. verbatim, 
um, or, or given. Um, not that that's a small thing, but we're not just talking about like, you know, the fact that they, they can differentiate the uh, collector uh, from the consumer as well. Yeah. And um, it's, it's very accurate. Um, so just the, just the nuance of, of, of having a, um, uh, a tool driven by AI and machine learning, uh, listen to all the calls, uh, go through them, render them to scripts, and then analyze them for compliance, and then feed that to your people that are actually looking at it and, uh, and interpreting and then following up. Um, but it takes away the, the huge bottleneck of having people having to listen to every single call. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a great tool. And one of the things we are very happy, like it's great working with uh, Lee and his team at Cascade, but one of the things that the machine actually also learns, it, it picks up a lot of the nuances that are very, uh, very specific to the rules and policies. And like Lee said, uh, their, their bar is so much higher than the, than the law, right? The law is kind of at some mm -hmm. level minimum what you need to do, but uh, Cascade insists on a much higher bar, uh, but, but the machine can be extremely customized and more importantly, learns a lot on its own. So then it's not, you're no longer playing a game of whack-a-mole where you're <laughs> correcting one thing and breaking another with respect to like yeah. false positives and stuff. Uh, you actually are making progress because the machine, and this is where the, this is where technology has massively improved in the last even three, four years is able to learn on its own. This was not possible uh, about a couple of years back. So from a, a realistic application standpoint, right? So somebody wants to apply this type of, of AI compliance level technology to their organization. Is it, you know, everything is automated now or is it a reduced number of live people that are listening to a more focused set of calls that have been identified for, you know, for human intervention, let's say? Like how far how far into the process does the automation go? Right? Is there? There's. I'm assuming that there's still some level of human interaction here. So if I've got a hundred thousand calls this month, right? I can't. My my compliance team can't listen to that. They can maybe yeah. listen to two thousand, right? And so, are you prioritizing those calls that need to that need some sort of human intervention? I, I, I'll give my perspective and would love these as well. Uh, so the short answer is. Uh, we we gone for uh, about 70 percent automation within within two or three months and but even within that there is a lot of variance something yeah. like a miranda we automate like close to 100 percent it is fairly objective and reasonably standard across a wide variety of uh, agencies in a network or a wide variety of uh, dead buyers on the other hand something like uh, did we show compassion and empathy a question like that probably still requires a little little human intervention because it is subjective. Like again, three of us listening to the same call might come to a different conclusion about mm -hmm. were we compassionate on this call. So those pieces remain, but on the whole, we target about 70 to 80% automation. And then even, even what is left behind is stack ranked, right? You, you don't want to be looking for needles in a haystack. You want to actually uh, prioritize things that have yellow mm -hmm. flags on them. So then you can, you know, say that, okay, this needs more work or saying, you know, this is possible. It, it's a very natural progression but yeah that's that's what we want to that's the standard we hold ourselves to understood lee how do you, how do you look at that right is this is it helping you to like sift for you know sift for gold so to speak and and be able to focus on those particular nuggets or are you guys using it in more of like a, a sweeping fashion yeah i mean with with uh, call compliance and really any application of technology um, <laughs> within cascade we try to be as quantitative as possible. And I mean, if there was a, uh, a chasm, if there's a, you know, a, a canyon and we're trying to get across, we're going to fill up as much of that expanse with mm -hmm. objective, uh, quantitative uh, analytics as possible to, to, you know, get, get as far as we can. Um, but we always, there's always, you know, a step or two that involves subjective interpretation and the human, uh, human engagement. Uh, so for example, like, Specific to prodigal uh, tonality, um, sometimes it's you know um, uh, it's tough to pick up on all tonality, and again, whether or not the uh, the agents, the collector is using empathy uh, with the consumer, um, there can be false positives relative to if it's the collector speaking yeah. or the consumer. Someone could uh, you know um, drop an expletive, and uh, the system could identify it as being. The collector, when in actuality we go back and listen to it, 
it's it's the consumer. Um, sure. It doesn't happen too often, but it does. So it's important to, to go back and actually listen to it. Um, sarcasm, any yeah. any you know scalability or shade of gray with tonality mm -hmm. that could indicate something that's in the gray area. Um, that's you know it's uh, you know he, he didn't you know curse at the person. He said to me, Miranda, but he was sarcastic as heck the entire conversation. Yeah. And, you know, almost to the point of belittling the consumer, that's not a compliant call. So yeah. there's a handful of things that, you know, that uh, um, in addition to the, the most obvious red flags or uh, uh, indications of a compliant call or a non-compliant call, um, you know, we we'll, we'll want to listen to those, but we also want to dig in and uh, look at some of the gray area stuff. Um, so with hu human involvement, that's, that's hugely important. But we're also at the end of a rendering, you know, we're, Prodigal is doing the bulk of the work, right? Sure. And identifying, identifying red flag uh, uh, calls um, or issues to look at, and then we kind of sift through the results and make sure that there aren't any false positives and anything else to consider um, subjectively. Yeah. So you guys are still doing random call audits on what's been going through the AI. So you're folk. It's a, a, the way that I'm interpreting that answer is that you're spending some of your time you know, or your compliance team is spending some of their time still focused on the actual <clears throat> like general calls. Like we're going to pull a random sampling and determine whether or not there were any flags that were picked up or missed. But then you're also on those where a red flag was identified. You guys are going in to evaluate that red flag and determine whether or not that was a false positive or there was actually something that needed to happen. So it sounds like you guys are are kind of looking at both perspectives there. One being, let's make sure that we're still kind of putting some level of, of let's say, icing on the cake here um, and making sure that the AI is interpreting things the way that we as humans are interpreting those things. But at the same time, those that are getting flagged, you're reviewing a much, or you're, you're required to review a much smaller yeah. volume of accounts that can be managed by Absolutely. humans, right? Okay, yeah. it, makes, yeah. it makes a lot of sense. But, but not just, I mean, compliance is kind of downside risk. The, the technology is really also meant to kind of capture the upside. What I mean by that is if, if, if a borrower asks you to call back at a certain time and your mm -hmm. notes don't show it, you don't end up calling them back. Uh, that's a lose lose for everyone, right? Because the borrower actually showed a strong intent and he needed, uh, he needed our help to, to kind of, you know, close the loop, but it just fell through the cracks. Now everyone is worse off. A lot of those are it's, it's legal not to call back but it is not best practice and so those are the kind of things where we actually want to automate a lot of that so that we ensure that we're actually capturing the upside and turning that into a very very thorough diligent kind of comprehensive process uh, where where we're closing the loop where we're doing the right thing on every single call uh, mm -hmm. Which is not just like far beyond compliance, not like no longer in the realm of like downside protection, but really looking at like what could it be, like what would uh, what would the best person do in this scenario, and make sure that every single person is is getting closer to their potential or the potential of the best person. So those are the kind of things where uh, technology really helps unlock uh, and, and you know avoid waste. Well, it sounds like the compliance piece here is um, is just one of the many facets, right? So, like, if we talk about the application of artificial intelligence to the receivables management space, part of that application is the compliance and the call monitoring and being able to handle a larger scale of items. But as we kind of talked about at the beginning, some of it actually comes down to what we're how to allocate resources and from the perspective of where do I want to spend time on accounts? So if I buy a hundred thousand accounts, which, you know, which 10,000 are most likely to pay and where do I want to allocate my time? So Lee, from your perspective, you know, is that something that you're looking at prior to a purchase or you're doing it post purchase? You know, how, how are you looking at the attributes of an account? Um, and, and like at what point in your kind of deal cycle are you applying that artificial intelligence to help you make better decisions? Uh, we're, we're applying data, da, uh, data analysis and data science throughout the life cycle of our investments. Um, but the, the biggest lever that a, a uh, investor in accounts receivable uh, can pull and the biggest uh, thing that dictates, dictates course on an investment is the mm -hmm. price that you pay. 
Sure. Yeah. The, more, the more that we can harness data and intelligence and um, you know uh, build models to predict future performance and to uh, predict uh, the uh, inherent and latent liquidity in a pool of receivables, mm -hmm. um, so we can project how it's going to perform over time. That's a big focus of ours. Um, so that's 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 the key, you know, the first key component. Because if you if you mess up your buy and you pay too much, then it doesn't really matter how good you are down the road. It's really hard to course correct, but it's impossible, right? There's nothing really you can do. It causes um, people to cut corners. Yeah. Yeah. You know, even then, uh, you know, with, with, you know, there's nothing you can do with longevity to uh, to course correct, and uh, you know, you, even cutting corners or breaking rules. Uh, in in the end, it's not a good business model. Um, Agreed. It might might get you out of might get, get you out of trouble on one investment. Um, but long term, it's no way to build a business. Hey, I think you're right. It, it makes it very very difficult um, to to kind of handle that piece. Um, so from a um, from an AI perspective, right? Um, and, and as we're looking at the application of um, of AI to kind of the scoring models, Shanta, are you seeing a difference between the way that you know collection agencies versus debt buyers are leveraging scoring for account focus? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, so. I, I actually use jump off using the longevity point that uh, Lee mentioned, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you can like this, I mean, you, you can't outrun what the price you pay in some ways. Mm -hmm. And so to that extent, it is extremely important to identify what are the traits uh, that, that predict this on the current portfolio? Um, what are the traits that you are you going to leverage to decide your next buy uh, mm -hmm. for, for an agency? Similarly, like for, sorry, for a debt buyer, like the moment you get some signals in one part of uh, your your network, the quicker you can propagate that inside uh, helps you kind of stay ahead of the game compared to other dead buyers, compared to like the capital ones and like, you know, original creators, because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, uh, there is only so much uh, that you can do. So timing mm -hmm. becomes extremely critical and dead buyers to that extent, uh, actually the biggest value is timing, like deciding what do you focus on this week versus what do you not focus on this week is the biggest difference a dead buyer can uh, use machine learning for compared to an agency. A agency is at some level, uh, it, it, it is a cost play, but a dead buyer, it is a timing play and the timing can impact liquidation curve. If not the absolute liquidation amount, how quickly do you get to that uh, plateau or asymptote makes a big difference in, in, in your return on capital because uh, it is at the end of the day, even if, if you can return capital in six months instead of eight months, uh, makes a big difference to your economics, even though the total capital, like what a return on invested capital dollar number is still the same doing it in eight months versus six months, sorry, doing it in six months versus eight months can make a world of difference. And that is a lot of what dead buyers uses for deciding what to work, what not to work. Uh, at some level, unfortunately, there's always going to be a part of your portfolio that is not recoverable and the sooner you come to that conclusion and, and and just kind of park that not spend more good 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 time after bad time the more profitable you will be because you'll your, your irrs and your return on investment capital will go up I, I don't know if lee that resonates with you but i would actually love to hear your perspective because uh i, I was telling adam not too many dead buyers actually uh, talk about these things yeah, I mean, the, the the greater degree of accuracy that you, you uh, uh, demonstrate when predicting what an investment will do over time, um, you know, the, the more capital you can raise, the less expensive capital you can raise. Mm. Um, I mean, it's really that's it's it's the business. So really, what we're talking about when predicting, you know, what a pool of receivables will will collect out at um, over time. Um, and then building a business around it. I mean, that, that is, that is the business I mean, without that ability, you can't acquire receivables in a, uh, um, you know, repeatable, um, and reliable manner. Um, so yeah, we, you know, we look at, um, or about six years ago now, we, we started to build models, um, in R, which is a, um, yeah. programming language for statistics. And, um, you know, we've, we've, uh, improved upon the models. And kind of hone them over time. Uh, they do learn. Um, you know, we've uh, 
feed them with data and, and train the models. Um, we know right now it's uh, um, the models themselves don't learn on their own. They, they do learn on their own, but they're, the data isn't being fed automatically to them. Yeah. Um, so we, we do it uh, in uh, uh, six month increments. Basically we'll, we'll update our models every six months or, or look at whether or not we need to. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very powerful. And without um, investing in uh, our, our analytics platform six years ago, and uh, also employing big, big data visual, visualization tools, um, we use yeah. Tableau for that. Yeah. Um, without yeah. building that reporting and that uh, analytical prowess and ability, um, I don't think we would, we would have been able to grow as we have, and then also be able to weather uh, down cycles and, and uh, all the kind of stuff that we're experiencing. Uh, today in this market. Yeah. I would think that your cost of capital is a major factor as a debt buyer and being able to better predict how you're spending that capital is going to improve your chances of having a lower cost of capital, right? Like lenders and, and partners, investors, how, however your capital raises are ultimately looking at how is that money being spent and what's the return on investment on that capital so the more that you can hone in and refine or optimize, um, the better off you're going to be. I think it's interesting that you're using tableaus for visualization. I think that's something that's become really popular over the past maybe five or six years. Um, I honestly had never heard of it before a few years ago, and now I've you know, been having conversations with some of the Zen masters, um, you know, in yeah. the tableau community, and trying to better understand what data looks like because uh, you know in the it's called the the early 2000s, you know, big data was becoming a thing, but nobody knew, you know, we, there was all of this information or all of this data, but nobody knew what to do. With it. And then yeah. as we moved into the 2010s, people started going, okay, well, <clears throat> we can segregate and we can segment things in these ways and we can start to, to learn from it. Now moving into the late 2000, you know, into the 2000 teens, we've seen a lot of that turn into the visualization of the data points and how do we then apply our insights or how do we learn from it by being visual folks because a giant spreadsheet full of numbers is great and I know Lee I've, I've watched you go through and evaluate something like that and been able to see your own visualizations but I'm a I'm a whiteboard kind of guy right like I want to stand up on the whiteboard and the visualization of that data or being able to see it presented in some sort of a visual format for me was when it started to really click about the value of large data. Then you move into, you know, the, <clears throat> the really late 2000 and teens and, and now into the early 2020s. And we're seeing the application of that large data set, that segmentation, right? It's like this incremental building of yeah. technology over time and now it's positioning organizations with the artificial intelligence to then take that to the total next level and better understand how to take that data now we understood it in the late 2000s and teens and now we're able to apply it into models that allow us to predict or better predict what future activities will yield i think that's yeah. really interesting especially as we've seen this compression of the margins within the collections industry, right? Um, because obviously we've seen some changes in our credit cycle. We've seen changes in charge offs over recent years and the marketplace has through COVID and everything else really seen some pretty significant changes, whether it's been positive or negative. So, you know, have you seen kind of the same thing from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, we, 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 we go, our, our industry, just like any other uh, market, uh, goes through cycles. Um, mm. And, uh, you know, a lot of that is, uh, revolves around supply and demand and any variation uh, of, of the two. Um, but I, I think also, you know, as we go through those cycles, uh, the industry is also maturing. It's evolving. It's becoming more efficient. Uh, like you said, margins are being compressed. Uh, and that's based upon, you know, prices going up and, and again, supply and demand uh, mm -hmm. anomalies. Um, but it's also just that we're, we're getting better at what we do. We're, we're you know, yeah. we're, um, we're using technology. We're becoming more efficient. Uh, the top line's increasing. The bottom line is increasing. Uh, we're, we're collecting more money and we're also, you know, saving money. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the net rendering um, is, is, you know, it's, it's going up, um, but it's competitive. Um, so you need tools at your disposal. Um, just 
just thinking about what you just said, Adam, you know, we're, we've really morphed in the last you know, 20 years from looking at top down uh, reports like stratification reports mm-hmm. you know, yeah. which are static. and um, you know, they're great because you look at a, a pool of receivables through a variety of lenses um, and you can say, OK, well, here is you know, a balanced strat. Here is a state level or geographic stratification. Uh, here's an age stratification report by you know, charge off date. Um, and then you would look at those those dynamics and then compare them maybe to a portfolio that you, you had purchased previously yeah. or that you managed previously. And so you kind of try to compare and contrast the two, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's, you know, uh, somewhat powerful and uh, demonstrative, but, uh, you know, it's, it's not scalable. It's not very efficient. Uh, and at the end of the day, it's not very accurate as well. You know, it's not. Um, a lot of so gut. What's that? It's a lot of gut. Yeah, right, yeah, it's a lot it's of gut reaction to things. Yeah. yeah, getting back to that that uh, that that chasm that we're trying to uh, get across, and and as much as possible, we want to you know use objective uh, quantitative analysis to do so. Yeah, um, yeah, it was probably you know half half quantitative and then half gut, right? Half half <laughs> art. Um, so uh, you know, g- going from from there to uh, running uh, regression analytics, you know, f- feeding feeding uh, a model data um, and over a period of time, uh, having to be homogenous uh, and consistent in the types of data going in. Uh, so you get the breadth and depth of data. It's, it's you know, it's a, it's a good data set and it's clean. Yeah. Uh, feed the model, run regression analytics, um, identify uh, what the most common uh, data attributes are that yeah. would indicate performance or non-performance. Um, and how those uh, work individually, how they interrelate to each other, uh, what the you know what what's important, what's not important, and of what is important that would indicate performance or not performance. What should the weighting be? What's uh, you know, what's the right balance uh, relative to the right age, uh, or or is there that combination to to be to be thinking about? Um, so it's pretty exciting and and it's powerful. And again, it allows us to be more accurate in what we do um, and more predictive. Um, and, and better all around. So, yeah, yeah just uh, riffing off of your uh, last ten or twenty years of evolution of our industry. Yeah, it's it's really you know gone from that. You know, sitting down and looking at just the you know uh, uh, states uh, by by face value and number of accounts per state in descending order. Going, hmm, what does this mean? You know, <laughs> have I seen this before? Uh, to you know, putting it into a model, having mm-hmm. algorithms run. Um, and having those models be continuously updated, um, and those algorithms, you know, rendering uh, a lot more accurate um, results than yeah. I could do with the Strat report back in 2002. Yeah, look, I mean, the stratification—it's we've come a long way from pivot tables, right? <laughs> like, I mean, that, that was the reality of it. I mean, look, and you and I did enough transactions, you know, through the years when I was at Credit Max and Sterling and. That was literally what I was doing. I'd take a portfolio, I'd run a pivot table, be like, so how many accounts fall into this state? What's the base value that falls into that state? Um, you know, let, let's break down the charge off date now and <clears throat> figure out where that goes. I mean, to think about where we started, you know, I just did my 17th consecutive RMAI conference, right? So like what we've learned through that time and how we've evolved as an industry from a data perspective has been really just amazing to see this this natural progression but i feel like like all great things in life it's been this incremental growth meaning we started with these pivot tables we had good information it was let's call it a 50 50 gut data decision and then we've continued to improve over time to the point now where we're running these you know quantitative business analysis um uh, uh, recurring um learning algorithms and now we're getting to a point where we're truly starting to understand or better be able to predict i'm sure that the um the predictability or the accuracy rate of what you're seeing today is considerably better than what it was back in the day because now you can have a higher degree of confidence that you know i'm sure you're still using some gut there too because there's not a lot that can replace 20 years of experience you know doing something um but i'm sure that's probably a little bit more high level now in terms of which which portfolios you feel are worth your time to run through the model right like i'm sure you're still using some natural gut there as well 
Yeah, absolutely. And the, you know, the, the human element and, uh, you know, subjective and qualitative analysis is important as well. I mean, every, yeah, every deal that we look at comes with a narrative, like a, a seller survey that you mm -hmm. read through. And that's important. You know, you can't get that in a data set and you know, a model or algorithm can't, can't, uh, well, actually, I'm sure that uh, someone could build AI that could read through a survey and standardize a standardized question and answer mm -hmm. form mm -hmm. and interpret the results. Um, but uh, thus far, we haven't, haven't, haven't done that. So uh, it's, it's, uh, it's important to be able to administer the tool, but also sit back and, you know, think about what it means and, and understand the provenance and the narrative behind the pool of AR that you're looking at. Sure. Um, you know, with, with about a little over five minutes left there, I did have one other question that I wanted to cover with you guys, and, and I'd like to get both of your perspectives on this. Um, you know, when we talk about the application of AI to our industry, you know, are, are these tool sets tied to the system of record in an automated format? And when I say system of record, I'm talking, you know, everybody's got different language here. So system of record, CRM, account management platform, right? Like let's, we're just, we're, we're talking about the same thing here. Um, and that's generally going to be tied back to the dialer platforms or whatever other communications technology omni-channel, right? Let's just all, all the, let's imagine I just said all of the keywords that relate to communications these days. Um, you know, are, are the tool sets directly tied in or is there still a manual interaction between um, like here, now I'm going to go run this through the model. So I'm pulling it out of one system, running it through the model and putting it back in, or has that process become more seamless? Lee, let's start I, with I, you from like, from your perspective, right? Because I'm curious as to how you guys are doing it. And I'm sure Shantanu is doing it in so many different ways that we're going to get kind of a, a more generalized answer. But like, how, how do you guys look at that application? Is it kind of like all inclusive or is this still kind of like an outside piece that you're running and then bringing the data back in? So we, we have our system of record and we have uh, external databases that we administer as well. Um, mm -hmm. So we have kind of a, it's a, a pretty good tapestry of, of uh, databases that we run in the background. Um, and uh, we have a lot of uh, automation of you know, file updates, file movement, scripts that run in the background, and uh, uh, processes that take place at night when uh, it moves off the server so uh, SQL doesn't get bogged down, et cetera. Um, so so we, have, we still have a, um, some manual file creations or you know, uh, uh, and, and file movement, but for the most part, it's automated, which is pretty powerful. So, and I, I should have prefaced this entire call with, um, while I'm involved with the top level strategic side of the business and, and the analytics, uh, I have a phenomenal team of uh, data analysts and IT professionals to make it all possible. So you yeah. mentioned you know, file movement and automation. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, it's huge, right? The more efficient we can be, the more money we can save and uh, uh, less human error involved, the better, so. Well, you really do have an amazing team. I, I was lucky enough to get to spend some time with them at the RMAI conference and, and always looking forward to seeing the Cascade team. And, uh, you know, you, you guys are just your staples of the industry. So it's, it's always great to get a chance to chat with your team and understand what the future of the industry looks like, because there's a lot of insight that can be gained from chatting with the people that have the boots on the ground in your organization. Shantanu, from your perspective, are you seeing more organizations that have this automated or like are directly tied into the systems of record? I know that you guys have some partnerships with some of the systems of record. Yep. Um, so I'm just curious as to how you're seeing that on the aggregate as more and more people are involved. Uh, so so I, I, I'll echo what Lee said. At the, bare, like, at the infrastructure level, there is a lot of automation and that leverages um, like the first generation of protocols, which is like uh, secure FTP and so on and so forth, like file transfer protocols. A lot of that is automated through like daily batch processes, um, sending CSV files back and forth. So that degree is automated, but that begets the question, like what can be? And this is where uh, different CRMs have uh, support, like different degree of sophistication. And like APIs is basically like the second or the third degree of protocols that uh, that that go beyond like what a secure FTP was maybe mm -hmm. 20 years ago. And sure. some some system of records or some CRM support APIs that let you actually not just transfer like bare metal uh, CSV files, but actually transfer a lot of intelligence, right? For example, like we can, even when we are working with uh, 
with, with Lee and his team at Cascade, uh, we can we, we send CSV data back and forth. But there's actually a much richer way of sending not only the scorecard and the basic performance, but actually sending like an annotated uh, context, like transfer the entire context in a, using an API that makes it so much richer. So then we are also transferring like sentiment, we are transferring the intent to pay scores that 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 carry a very specific context. Uh, and in order to do that, you need APIs which allow that level of sophistication. Uh, so while the automation at the bare like data transfer level is 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 very, very prevalent, uh, the industry is making a transition to automation at the intelligence level which is no longer are we just transferring data back and forth every night, but are we transferring insights back and forth? And then once yeah. you get that layer, then we actually unlock uh, real time insights, right? Uh, it's it's one thing to look at, like you said, stratification by state, but like movement as an alert in one part of your network, how quickly can we propagate that alert for that one account to every other person who might also be working that account on a, for, a, for a different original creator? Uh, some of that, alert some of that intelligence some of that like rich rich transfer of insight uh is is work in progress i think and we are we're very excited by the direction where we are going but the moment that happens the moment we're able to like propagate those insights not just data but insights and mm -hmm. very specific, like rather than saying like take this csv file and run like a different process at the end of the night on the other side uh, transfer that very specific thing like you get a notification when when your flight tickets become cheaper like that is relevant for you you're not getting a csv file of all flight tickets uh, all flight prices every night so the the increasing the insight increasing the relevance uh, is something we are working towards using apis and not all crms are there yet but it is the moment we, we are actually building some of our own apis so that we are crm agnostic a system of record agnostic but once we get that um, you you will see a lot of like real time decision making so again going back to the tableau thing the beauty of it is uh, you actually get a lot of visual data visual feedback and the more real time we can make it uh, the the better your team will react to it so for example for pro notes which is our product we've actually done a lot of gamification and the wonders of that are massive right because now we're closing the loop on that feedback uh, no longer are we saying at the end of the week, this is your performance. This is how much time you spent in, in, in various stages. That's like too little, too late, too deferred. You're actually like giving that insight in real time. And that is driving a lot of behavior. I would think that the standardization of the notes through pro notes would provide additional insights. And so Absolutely. beyond yeah. what can be passed in a CSV file or easily passed in a CSV file via a secure FTP service that APIs would be required to, to really maximize the value of the algorithms as it applies to the standardized notes. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, and, and that may be another discussion for another day, because I feel yeah. like I might take you down the rabbit hole with that one. But is that, is that an accurate statement? Like the, the use of, of kind of standardized notes is allowing for a deeper insight into kind of account level information? Yes, that is definitely the next step. And then the third step is workflows, right? So standardization kind of enables workflow. So uh, once you have standardized, once you communicate like a bankruptcy or once you communicate a do not call in a very standardized way, the next step is how do you automate uh, the, the downstream workflow in a very, very automated way, uh, in a very automated way. So standardization enables like personalization at scale. So you can deliver the same personal value to everyone, uh, all, all thousand, let's say 1,000, 10,000 people who fit a certain criteria. So it is personal mm -hmm. you're delivering a very, very specific message or delivering a very specific uh, benefit, but you're doing it to 10,000 people at a particular point. So you're no longer like, yeah, you're no longer like. Uh, Scalability like, for the receivables management industry through the yeah. application of technology. And I think that's. Yeah. I think that's a, a great kind of ending note for us today, gentlemen. I, I really appreciate you guys coming on. I know we went a little bit off of our original outline, but I think this was a great discussion about the application and how to leverage artificial intelligence within the receivables management space. Lee, thank you so much for coming on and talking about how you guys are actually using this with Cascade 365 and, and Shantanu for you coming on and telling us more 
about the actual technology that's being leveraged both at Cascade 365 and beyond across the industry. Um, for anybody that's watching or is, is watching the replay on YouTube, feel free to ask questions below. Um, I will be getting those questions over to both Shantanu and over to Lee so that we can answer those questions for you and keep the discussion going off into the future. Um, but gentlemen, thank you again so much for taking your time today. I really appreciate you coming on, having a chat with us. I thought this was a great discussion. Likewise. Thanks for having us. Awesome. We'll see you again soon, gentlemen. Thanks so much. Cheers. Yes. Good day, guys.